I have to give out a shout out to not my boy Frodo because oh my god Frodo I love Elijah Wood right I love Elijah Wood he's a great actor he's a great presence on and off the camera and I love the Lord of the Rings films for the most part you know I think I don't love them as much as other people love them but I certainly I came into them quite late and I enjoyed them for what they were but all the time I'm thinking and look I know I know I know what everyone's gonna say oh but you and Frodo had the one ring and he and he had to, that's what made him an ass it's like no that's no excuse the entire of that film Samwise Gant is literally carrying him on his back dragging him across this bloody bread and then Gollum's there just there trying to corrupt him going Oh, Frodo, don't trust fat hobbitses. And I'm just there like, Frodo, you absolute stupid idiot. Why, why are you gonna try, why? L look at him, look at him. He's, he's biting the, 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 the heads off a fish, right? And you got your boy, Sam, and Frodo's all there like, well, I suppose that Sam is a little bit of an ass. And then goes to listen to Gollum for the rest of the film. And honestly, I just hate it so much. He's just there going, Sam, I can't do it, Sam. Sam, I can't. And, and Sam is just there like, Bloody hell, Mr. Frodo, and it's it's the entire the entire saga is just Frodo being a little bitch, and it does my head in for the entire thing, and like I just he just annoys me every time he's on screen. I'm just like, oh god, why? Oh, why don't you just give the ring to Sam? He wouldn't be such an ass about it. He just get he get he'd roll up his sleeves, you know what? He'd roll up his sleeves, have a bit of bread, and then get on with his job. But no, Frodo's just there going. <laughs> I'm Frodo! Hoo hoo! Hee hee! Ha ha! And I hate it. I hate it so much. Also, I hate Legolas. <laughs> Going on a massive tangent now. Legolas is just, he's OP, mate. He just, he kills every. No, he just kills everyone. He just, he's not as bad as, because, you know, he's actually quite cool and he does, he does everything. But then Frodo, oh my god, Frodo, just, oh, I'm Frodo! Hmm. <laughs> Mm. Right, at the risk of upsetting the kind of lads who ask for Top Gear box sets and bottles of dupe for Christmas, I have prepared a series of notes on why I absolutely cannot get away with James Bond, <laughs> if that's alright. So, I, well, it's, I've had to shorten it down just for the purpose of the video, right? So this is just things he's done in films, which every time I've maybe gone, sorry, why is this man? The hero, he once agreed to dominate a man's daughter because they both agreed that's what she needed. He uh, wore yellow face that time with the uh, comedy eyebrows. He trapped a man in a suitcase so he could have sex with his assistant. He tells a nurse she'll be fired if she doesn't bang him in a sauna. Uh, he punches a load of doctors in the face. I love this one. Punches a load of doctors in the face who are trying to save him from a heart attack he is pretending to have. He uh, threatens to break the arm of a woman to get information out of her, but then obviously sleeps with her, obviously. Uh, he puts the body of his friend in a dumpster and says he wouldn't have minded. Uh, he knocks out a load of his colleagues because they're going the wrong way in a lift. He goes to a facility full of vulnerable, brainwashed women and shags his way through it. He uh, forces a woman to strip at gunpoint. He lets a woman drown for helping him. He lets a woman get shot in the head for helping him. Uh, there's the oil thing. There's like basically five or six or seven women who just die because they helped him. And he's like, oh, well, spy stuff, I guess. Uh, he tricks a woman into giving up a virginity. Uh, he breaks into a woman's house to try and nail her right after she's just buried her husband. He breaks into a woman's shower to try and nail her right after he found out she was sex trafficked. Uh, he fights alongside the Mujahideen, Josh, you like this one, who, as we all know, became Al-Qaeda. Yep, that's right. There's like a million examples of him just roughing up women because it was the done thing back then. Uh, in Tomorrow Never Dies, he kisses a dead woman. And the worst one of all, right, he shakes his martinis. Right, when you shake a drink, you add air to it, which is obviously fine if you've got a cocktail, which has got like loads of like strawberry and stuff in that. But like, it's a subtle drink, and he asks for it fizzy from a barman. The guy is the worst on earth. I can't do it. I can't do it. And every time, I'm like, oh, it's another. He's done another film. Get rid. Get rid. Get rid. But what about all the good stuff he's done? He's the worst spy on earth, man. Like, spying's meant to be subtle. Ah, all right, I'll just sneak in here, take some documents and leave. Like, no, 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 gonna bang her, 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 then explode the facility. He tells people his name! He's a spy who tells people it. Nah, I'm done. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> well, I want to give a shout out, first of all, to pretty much the entire cast of Love Actually, especially the fellas, and especially Colin, the king of sex, because, like, I watch that movie every year, and all of them are insufferable. I don't know why I root for them, but I still do. But my real pick is Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man. And I thought Andrew Garfield was going to be the one for me, because I loved him in The Social Network. I thought he was a really good actor. But they just completely messed up the character, because they tried to modernize him, because Tobey Maguire was very much indebted to the like, classic version of Peter Parker as a nerd with like specs and uncool. This new version was a skateboarding hipster, and that is fine. But the, the worst sin is that he was also a 
Well, they tried to make him a quippy funny man, but they just made him a bit of an asshole. Because there's one point in the first movie where he's got the person he thinks has killed his uncle, let, may I add, and he's just like toying with them and he shoots him in the with his with his webs and he's kind of having fun with it. He's, it's like, are you a sociopath? Are you a psychopath? Are you a hero after all? And it's kind of weird throughout that movie. And then in the second film, he has this relationship with Gwen where he sort of stalks her. He does this Edward Cullen thing where he just spends most of his time on the top of buildings watching his ex-girlfriend live a life. And it's like, that ain't on, dude. You know what I mean? You've got better things to be doing for one. You're a superhero. Don't spend this time searching after your ex. And two, just be nicer. He kind of pushes her, pushes her away. He's emotionally unavailable. He's not, like, on point with her. And then she dies at the end. And it's... It's like, oh, that's our hero, I guess. Andrew, come on, buddy. Like, you're better than this. He said he regretted his time in the role because he didn't get to give the performance he wanted to give. And I think the writing was just so bad. And it, it, it from, for me, for all the problems those movies had, the core of it was just his Spider-Man was, was flawed. And now we've got Tom Holland, who's miles better. And I, I didn't think I would ever say that because I love Andrew Garfield. But stop stalking women from the top of rooftops. Um, well with great sorrow, great pain, because I'm a massive fan of the franchise, really, which is it's kind of a guilty pleasure. It's It's got to be Dominic Toretto. He's just, I started off, I was, I, was, I was a huge fan of him as a character. He kind of, he anchored the film, I'd say, in a way, in the, in the first Fast and Furious, and then I loved him again in, no, he wasn't into Fast and Furious, obviously, and he wasn't in the third one. I missed him, I missed him a lot. I need that presence back. I need him back in the room. And then he came back for Fast and, Fur for Fast, Fast and Furious. There's a lot of them. Uh, he came back for that one, and I was buzzing. I was like, "Yeah, cool, the energy's back." And then things just things got weird. From like Fast Five onwards, he just kind of became a superhero who can beat anything up and just can't die. He can be in plane crashes. He can get beaten up by men who are like a good hundred pounds heavier than him. It, it just everything became a bit kind of, "Oh, this is me looking like the awesome action hero of the film." And never mind the cars. The car I came for the cars. Okay, I came for the cars. I came for the explosion. In the end, I came for the explosions. When that started happening, it came this huge just explosion fest. I was in, I was game. What I didn't come for is Vin Diesel staring at me for most of the film going, oh, ride it down, man. Yeah, Vin, Vin Diesel, oh, la, la Familia. That's the worst Vin Diesel impression ever, but yes, I've, I've not quite hit puberty yet. Uh, but yeah, it just, he vexes me now. Every time, it, even in the new trailer, I was like, okay, John Cena's here, woo, yeah, everyone's back. All the, all the characters kind of, I've come to love everything else. Yeah, the cars are exploding, but now he's catching vehicles. Vin Diesel can now catch vehicles. This, this character, this Dominic Toretto character, has, has kind of progressed to the point now where he's literally superhuman. And it vexes me. It just annoys me because he had such a nice kind of deep family oriented story early on, which was believable. Yes, he was a criminal. He was a criminal at the, at the end of the day. He was like this hero, this person we're meant to be following, supporting all the way through these films was a criminal. He was stealing things, but we still loved him. He was a lovable, like, rogue. Now he's just a... He, he didn't get beaten up by The Rock, okay? He didn't die when The Rock beat him up. So that's that's a big issue as well. So at the end of the day, I don't like Dominic Toretto because I just think he's ridiculous now. I'm sorry. It didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to be this way. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invoke the wrath of the internet because I have a bit of a thing. Um, well, actually, I'll, 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 I'll start mild and we'll see how we go. I hated the first time I saw it. I hated Deckard in uh, Blade Runner. Um, and uh, I hated Blade Runner initially. I think a lot of people did. I think there's so many people I've talked to when I hated it the first time through, but oh, over time I convinced myself it was good and I love it now. But I don't even know if I'm, if it's actually honesty at this point. I do think I love it now, but I always thought that Deckard was terrible. Um, and mainly because, I mean, you read into the, uh, the shooting of that film, they had all these different production woes and all this different stuff with Ridley Scott, where he literally had to get the set and put it on some lorries and drive it down the street to finish filming. It was a bit of a tumultuous shoot. Um, and I think some of that comes through in the performance. But for me with Deckard, I just thought he was like Harrison Ford played him as just being so just empty, just kind of just oh yeah whatever like just can't be bothered like like all replicants like just there was no energy to it there was no and he's meant to be this sort of retired uh, detective being dragged back in but I thought it was like it's a fine line to walk between you know like serious and intense and contemplative and just bored and I just thought he was really boring and then there's that really horrible love scene where it's literally a rape scene where he blocks the door and forces himself on that woman I hated that and apparently that was literally because on set they really had 
had really bad chemistry so they had to force it through and for me that <laughs> made me just detest the character but I hated it to that point anyway um, and for me it never that movie just fell apart because you're supposed to be questioning how much humanity is in him anyway and obviously there's that whole unicorn twist at the end and stuff but there was just so much stuff in that movie where I was just like I really hate this guy like I detest this guy and some parts of that come across like I said I'm starting mild some parts of that come across into Indiana Jones as well and I really hate um, it's in whatever you call the third one you know the one with the what we call the third one, the one with his dad, um, where he grabs that woman. He's just shaking that woman. I'm like, Harrison Ford, stop groping women. There's been some videos done online about how he's really hands-on with women. I'm sure he's a lovely man. I love him a lot in Force Awakens, but there are some roles, uh, like, like like I said, in Jenna Jones and Decker, where he's really, really horrible. Um, and I, yeah, I've gone back and I, I love the cinematography, the cyberpunk style, the things that come through in Blade Runner over time, but I absolutely detest that character. And so I've kind of like, you know, got better over time looking at the positive but there's a lot to hate in that film and a lot to hate about those performances so yeah well I feel a lot better about this because I've heard Scott's personal hated hero and I think it makes me disliking Harry Potter a little bit less a little bit less awful because I know he's a good dude right he's a good kid and he grows up to be a, a good adult he's the chosen one and he means very well and he's not a wizard racist which is crucial for the storyline but also like I think when I watched it, when I was a kid, because I watched them when I was a pretty similar age to Harry Potter, I was like, this is great. I feel exactly like this character, like, this is perfect. You know, he makes mistakes, but he makes mistakes because he's a kid and it's fine. And then I grew up and I thought, no, actually, I was, a, I was a terrible child. And Harry Potter is also a terrible child. Think about it, right? In the first film, he finds out he has, like, untold wealth because his parents are dead, and so it's all his. And his best friend is absolutely broke, you know, can only just have like some clothes, doesn't even have a wand. He's a wizard who doesn't even have a wand, he has a hand-me-down wand that sabotages him for literal years. Does Harry think, oh, I should probably, I should probably help him out. You know, the, the kid whose family have basically adopted me, make sure I don't get abused at home by letting me live at theirs for Christmas. Maybe I should give him like, I don't know, like, and a millionth of my incredible wealth? No. He's like, sucks that you're poor, Ron. Oh, um, don't know how it feels. Me and Hagrid are gonna just go hang out, like drink some butterbeer. Hope you don't, you know, suffer. I just, I just think there's so much potential for him to be genuinely nice, but instead he's just like, it's so hard being the chosen one. Well, he might not actually even be the chosen one because it probably was Neville as it turns out. I just, again, means really well, but in execution, what, what, what does he do aside from beat up the guy who comes after him every year and he, he knows basically he's like, oh, 25th of December, is it? Probably Voldemort, probably Voldemort at the door. Like, just feed Ron, please. <laughs> <laughs> like once, that's all I ask. This is incredibly low hanging fruit compared to everything else we have had in this uh, chatty faces of doom and annihilation for all things good in this world. Um, I, but to be fair, I've like realized so many things about characters I didn't even know from listening to all these. I'm like, oh, everyone's terrible but um, one that is really easy to hate because he's just a freaking and is supposed to be presented as this sympathetic hero is uh, Jim from Passengers who is the guy who he wakes up on his big spaceship who's going to another planet he's gonna go on a colony mission and uh, he wakes he wakes up early really early Far too um, late for him to ever have a chance of going home, far too early to ever have a chance of living on this thing. He's going to live out the rest of his life on this spaceship, it's like 120 years or something, that he is going to be awake for. And he's like, oh, oh crap. And he can't get into the crew areas to wake crew up to help him fix it, so he's just got to mosey on around, talk to the bartender, who's a robot, and um, just do his thing, basically, watch entertainment stuff. And uh, instead of like thinking, ah, well, I have nothing to do here, like, um, maybe I'll do some more entertainment, maybe I'll do something the other, maybe I'll do something meaningful on the ship, I don't know, he could do anything, he could make a beautiful artistic mural, I don't know. He spends a year faffing around before he, before he discovers a beautiful woman in a pod, and, um, he wakes her up, basically, is, is the whole plot of the story, he wakes her up and doesn't tell her why he woke her up, he's like, oh, you woke up accidentally, like me, that's fine, we can bang now, and that's like the whole thing, that's the whole narrative crux of this story is, oh, I'm gonna wake up Aurora, bit on the nose, and uh, basically try and bang her for the next eternity. It's just horny nonsense. It's just horny nonsense. Like if he really wanted someone to wake up to keep him company, he could have woken up anyone, and he should have told them straight away, look, I'm living out this thing on this ship. It's, it's really lonely, I need company, whatever. Just be honest from the outset, they're stuck on the ship with you at that point anyway. If you're gonna do it, like, it's not the fact that he woke her up because 
the whole film is this interesting narrative exploration of what a human would do that we're social creatures, that we need company and socialising and that sort of thing. Like, fair enough that he does a really horrible thing and is a flawed human character. Great, whatever. Um, but he doesn't tell her, he doesn't tell her, and then uses, uses his information that he's read up on a dossier to try and seduce her, basically, and just spend the next 120 years putting his end away. That is why he wakes her up. He wakes her up for a little bit of frickin' Rumpy act. Pumpy. A bit of Rumpy Pumpy, exactly. And it's just great, great, Jim. You're, like, you could have woken up anyone. You could have had someone that you had big philosophical discussions with. Not that he doesn't with Aurora, of course, but it's just, he picks, like, categorically the most attractive woman he can to pork. And then, and then, at the end, she's like, oh, actually, it was fine, wasn't it? When she finds out that he's woke her up and then they fix the ship and they're like, oh, okay, here, woohoo. They, uh, she's like, oh, yes, fine, that's great, wonderful. Let's live out our life together alone on this ship for 80 years and build a cottage in the middle of the pasture that we've got in the middle of the ship. Great. No, no, that's not a happy ending. She should have punished him. That's, that's a problem with the film more than Jim, but Jim, you you're a you're, you did a human thing, but you did it wrong and badly, and you should not have. Team Jim. <laughs>